So today we are continuing with the stuff from last lecture, regulation and especially of glucose metabolism. And let's hope for the best that we get this up and streaming. Wow. Most wonderful good morning. This time it was easy. Most wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Most wonderful good morning. Most wonderful good morning. And a very beautiful good morning. Good morning.
Good morning. A most wonderful good morning. Good morning. A most wonderful good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Most wonderful, oh no, sorry, you're not going in there. A most wonderful good morning. Thank you. Most wonderful good morning. Most wonderful good morning. Good morning. Oh dear, is it that good? I didn't get to sleep till three o'clock. Why? Well, I couldn't sleep, so I started working out and I didn't finish working out till two o'clock, and then my adrenaline was going. I just couldn't sleep. Most wonderful good morning. A most wonderful good morning. Good Lord, where's the rest? Are they all self isolating, eh? We need you. At one point, it should be 250. Hmm. Maybe not.
see if there are more people coming. Good, then let's get started. All right, uh, let's make a start. Most wonderful good morning to uh, everybody who were brave enough to come in today, you know, with all the virus stuff and uh, things like that. Um, at one point, I thought I might ask you whether we should just simply do online lectures, but I thought that's a really slippery slope, and I better not go down that route. Uh, so I will not ask you that question. Um, please don't forget uh, to record your attendance. Um, and I'm not saying anything about it. Uh, also, please remember to finish the, the quizzes. You should be able to do all of the quizzes apart from the last one because there is still some stuff to come next week that is part of the last uh, quiz. I think that's quiz six or something like that. Um, but there's nothing that can stop you from having a, a peek at that. And if there are problems with the quizzes, uh, please do let me know. Um, I hate to find out that there was an issue uh, after the quiz has closed, because that's, that's my worst nightmare. Uh, OK, so uh, last week, uh, when we started basically the metabolism uh, section, we were really focusing on glucose, how we get energy from glucose, how we can basically survive life. And we will still maintain this uh, theme today. Um, last week I showed you the pathway of glycolysis, where we basically start with um, glycogen in the muscle. And I told you uh, we have two basic uh, glycogen stores. In the liver, we have about 100 grams. And in the skeletal muscle, we have got about 400 grams. Bless you. And this amount of glycogen will really see us through one day. So 24 hour of activity. Uh, that is what this glycogen can actually do. And just as a reminder, if we need short-term energy boost, uh, Red Bull, no, sorry, uh, ATP, but that will only last you for five to six seconds. Uh, that's the ATP uh, that is present in, in the muscles. And ATP can be regenerated through uh, creatinine phosphate and creatin creatine phosphate kinase, but as I said, the amount of ATP that we can generate that is for five to six seconds. If you need more energy, you need to go into the glycogen stores. And I showed you that the glycolysis, the anaerobic glycolysis goes basically from glucose. So we start with glycogen from glucose over several steps. We end up basically with pyruvate. We get net two ATPs and we get two NADHs out of it. And that was the principle of the 
uh, glycolysis. In, uh, in the session on Monday, I showed you some ways how glycolysis is regulated because it is such a fundamental process, there needs to be some regulation. And even more so because today we will discuss what happens if you run out of, gl uh, of, of glucose in the cell. So I showed you the regulation that is, for example, triggered by glucagon. a very important hormone which is secreted from the alpha cells in the, let me get that right, in the islet of Langerhans. And I don't think I've mentioned that the other day. Islet of Langerhans in the pancreas. So that's my artistic interpretation of a pancreas. Uh, the pancreas, as you know, secretes hormones that are, uh, secretes enzymes that are predominantly involved in the breakdown of food. So, for example, uh, breakdown of uh, sugars, breakdown of proteins in the intestine, and these secretory um, enzymes are predominantly produced in the pancreas, but the pancreas also has little sort of islets, little clusters of cells, and these clusters of cells actually uh, produce hormones that are important for uh, glucose homeostasis, for making sure that we have always the right amount of glucose in the blood. And we have alpha cells in the pancreas, in these islet cells, in these clusters, in these clumps, and these alpha cells produce the glucagon and I showed you how glucagon indirectly by activating so glucagon activates uh, a second messenger producing uh, enzyme which is called adenylate cyclase This adenylate cyclase produces cyclic AMP, and this cyclic AMP is an activator for protein kinase A. And protein kinase A can then take ATP, takes ATP, and attaches a phosphate residue to target proteins. So, atta attaches phos or it phosphorylates, ph oh. attaches phos phosphate, yeah, phosphate molecules to target proteins. Where does it attach these phosphate molecules? Well, there are basically two different types of kinases. I think actually protein kinase A, yeah. Um, you have, you can attach a phosphate residue to amino acids that have in their side chain an OH group. So
So BI300. Which amino acids have an OH group in their side chain? You did that, didn't you? Amino acids? Yeah? It might be useful to learn amino acids for your exams. And please don't do it like a friend of mine did because she thought she is very artistic. She had the structure of all the amino acids on her fingernails, a sort of you know, beautiful artwork on her fingernails. Looks, looked absolutely beautiful, but she had to remove it before the exam. So which three amino acids have OH groups as a side chain? Do you want to ask the audience? What amino acid is that? No? Serine, thank you. And T stands for? Hmm? THR? What is it? Threonine, yes. Serine and threonine have both OH groups as a side chain. And I think PKA is a serine threonine kinase. So it just simply attaches a phosphate group from the ATP to the OH group of SMT. And there's another amino acid. That is <coughs> that uses a different protein ki that uses different kinases. What does Y stand for? Yeah, loud? Tyrosine. Yes, absolutely. So Y stands for tyrosine. So these are the three amino acids that can accept phosphate groups. You've got a lot of revision to do for the exams, eh? <laughs> but they are still a couple of months away, so don't panic. And last, uh, and on Monday I showed you how PKA then can activate the bifunctional enzyme phosphofructokinase 2. at least one of the functions. And it, however, it has also more functions, as I will show you in a minute. Because when we have um, glycogen, glycogen is also under the regulation of glucagon or the glycogen metabolism, is under the regulation of glucagon. Most hormones have also something that counterbalance its action. So glucagon is basically the hormone that is secreted by the pancreas when our glucose levels in the blood are low. Gluco glucagon signals to the liver 
predominantly deliver, oi, mate, we have a problem. Our glucose is too low. Do something. Release glucose. <laughs> because we need glucose, since glucose is more or less the only food that our brain and the red blood cells can utilize. No glucose, no brain activity. I could make loads of jokes now about uh, that and, and politicians and things like that, uh, but um, I will better refrain from doing so. So glucagon says, give me sugar in the blood. The opposing hormone to glucagon is, loud? is insulin, exactly. Insulin has exactly the opposite effect to glucagon. And insulin is also produced and secreted in the pancreas, and this time in a slightly different cell type. It is in the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans. And insulin basically is the hormone that signals, whoa, we've got lots of glucose in the sugar, do something. Now, I thought about what would be the best analogy for that. And of course, the current situation let me compare it. Let me compare insulin and glucagon to something that we are probably more familiar with. Insulin says, hey guys, I have discovered a stack of toilet paper. Right? Now, let's get this toilet paper and keep it safe somewhere. Or in other terms, Insulin says, hey, there is lots of glucose in the blood. Let's use this glucose. Let's not let this glucose go to waste. Because while the kidney can filter out glucose quite effectively from the blood, it can do so only up to a certain level. Otherwise, then, if it stops filtering, you just simply pee glucose. That's actually what you do when your insulin regulation doesn't work and you end up with diabetes. This was actually the test whether somebody has diabetes previously, where there were no test kits. What the doctor did was urine sample Oh, it's sweet, has diabetes, tough. So insulin says, let's get the stash of sugar in the blood and put it somewhere. Put it somewhere safe. It's quite interesting, the insulin, how is insulin actually secreted? What, what makes insulin be secreted? That's a really interesting thing, because in the islet cells, in the beta cells, you have a, glu a glucose transporter, this transporter GLUT2 allows glucose to move into the cell. Nothing terribly exciting. In the cell, in these beta islet cells, the glucose is immediately phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate. So it can't get out. And then, <coughs> over several pathways, we get ATP, of course and we break down the glucose into smaller components. So we use uh, the, the glycolysis pathway 
in the beta cells. So far, so good, nothing exciting. Now, an increase of ATP inside these beta cells will close specific potassium channels. And they are ATP sensitive channels. So an increase in ATP shuts down these channels. <coughs> and usually, potassium is transported out of the cell. But in this case, when the channel is blocked or closed, potassium accumulates inside the cell and makes the inner side of the cell more positive. This then, in turn, activates a voltage-gated calcium channel. Voltage gated means there is a change in the, in the potential which is caught by these positive charges inside. So you make the cell more positive, it depolarizes the membrane and activates this calcium channel. And as a consequence, calcium moves into the cell. What does the calcium do? Well, in the islet cells, of, uh, in the beta cells, you have insulin, which is a short peptide. You have insulin in preformed vesicles. They are sitting there just under the cell membrane in these vesicles. <coughs> but in order to fuse with the cell membrane, and be released, calcium is required. And that is the calcium that we just transported in. So what you basically see in this pathway is when glucose comes in, the cell senses, ah, glucose in. Hey, cool. We do all this pathway, ATP, ATP uh, sensitive potassium channels, depolarization of the membrane, activating of the voltage-gated calcium channels, calcium influx, calcium mediates the fusion of the vesicles with the membrane and insulin release. And then the insulin signals to cells there is lots of glucose, let's use it. And how can we actually use glucose? Well, in the liver and in the skeletal muscle, what we do is we use the glucose that comes in, and what insulin actually does, one of the things that insulin does is, if you've got a liver cell, we have insulin, and insulin through some rather complex pathways which, which, uh, with which I don't want to bore you, but what it does is it activates and directs glucose channels to the cell membrane. In this case, especially in the liver, we have the GLUT4 channel, and they are glucose uptake channels. And now, glucose goes into the cell out of the bloodstream, 
and it will get, if we've got high levels of glucose in the skeletal muscle, it will be immediately phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate, so it can't go out. And in the liver, it will also usually be phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate. And what we can do, once we've got glucose 6-phosphate, we can shift, we can either then drive it into glycolysis, but there would be a breakdown. Maybe we have already enough energy anyway. What we want to do is we don't want to use the toilet paper, we want to stack it. So we want to store the glucose, and in order to do so, we shift the phosphate to the one position. I told you the other day, last week, the enzyme for that is phosphoglucomutase. And then we activate this molecule, this G1P, glucose 1-phosphate. We take G1P, we add UTP, uridine triphosphate. Usually we work with ATP, but in this case we use UTP. We remove a pyrophosphate <coughs> that is when two phosphate molecules are still together and what we get is UDP glucose. And the enzyme that does that, I'm not writing that down, I'm not going to ask you that, is called UDP glucose pyrophosphatase 2, Phosphor phospholiase 2. Can't even get it right. So it a, has a complex name. But it converts the glucose 1 phosphate into an even more active UDP glucose. And that is the starting point for when we want to make glycogen. So how do we make glycogen? If we want to start glycogen from afresh, from basically scratch, we can't do it. There's no enzyme that can take a glucose molecule and we take another glucose molecule and a third glucose molecule and start sort of the glycogen chain. What we need is a primer that is sitting there and this primer is not glucose. It is a protein called glycogenin. This is a protein this protein actually grabs a glucose molecule and attaches it to itself. <coughs> Boom. Grabs another one. Grabs another one. We need about six to eight of these glucose molecules attached to glycogenin before it can become a substrate for the enzyme
glycogen synthase. Glycogen synthase then takes a UDP glucose and transfers it to the growing chain. And it releases UDP. And I told you, the way we do it is we have glucose 1, 4, glucose 1, 4, glucose 1, 4, and so on and so forth. <coughs> but we can also add glucose to the 6th position. But this is not done by glyco glycogen synthase. In order to add a glucose to the sixth position of another molecule of glucose, we need an enzyme that sort of creates a branch. As you can see here, we, we are creating a little branch here. And in creatively, this enzyme that does that is called the branching enzyme. So glycogen synthase and branching enzyme create glycogen. They build up the stack, the store of glucose. So, how is glycogen production actually regulated? We can probably figure it out with what we already know. So, we need to regulate it. And the regulation happens, amongst others, at the level of glycogen synthase. Now, what we can say is we only want to build glycogen when there is loads of glucose in the blood. When we have, when insulin says, get this done, store it as glycogen. <coughs> so insulin will probably have an impact on glycogen synthase and makes it active. Makes it active. And I should simply abbreviate it as glycogen synthase with GS. We can also make it inactive. Good afternoon. Are you supposed to be in No, OK. Not a double booking. I thought they, they look quite keen. So we can inactivate 
glycogen synthase. And the way we do that is, again, with a little phosphorylation event. So we need a kinase that basically shuts off glycogen synthesis. And here is our already very well known enzyme protein kinase A. Protein kinase A shuts off glycogen synthesis. And we know that glycogen, that protein kinase A, is under the control of glucagon. through CAMP, cyclic AMP. So glycogen synthase, if glucagon is around, glucagon says, do not store the glucose. Release it into the bloodstream, please. We need the glucose desperately. So glucagon shuts off glycogen synthase through pKa. Insulin, on the other hand, activates glycogen synthase. How does it do that? Well, insulin activates an enzyme which is called diphosphodiesterase. And what does diphosphodiesterase do? It basically destroys CAMP. So if we've got insulin, it activates diphosphodiesterase, or phosphodiesterase. You find both names. It destroys CAMP converts it into A and P. If we don't have CAMP, then pKa can't be activated. If pKa is not activated, we have the reverse. We, we, we can't produce the phosphorylated gl uh, glycogen synthase, but we still have the reverse reaction by the enzyme PP1. I write it like that. And that is a protein, phosphoprotein phosphatase. <coughs> and I told you last, on Monday, what we have here is, again, is a nice switch system. It's the zero-order ultrasensitivity, or some people call it also uh, a substrate cycle. And in this substrate cycle, we can switch it on, switch it off. So insulin activates the glycogen synthesis. Glucagon shuts it down. And you see this really nice antagonistic behavior. One says, yes, we need glucose. The other one says, uh, yes, we need to make glycogen. The other one says, no, don't do it. And depending on your status, whether you have lots of glucose in the blood, then you produce insulin. Insulin is secreted, and it says, yes, do something. Or if there is no glucose or very little glucose in the blood, then glucagon kicks in and says, hey, we need 
glucose in the blood activate the glycogen stores. <coughs> yeah, does that make sense? So glucagon says activate activate the glycogen stores. We need glucose in the blood. <coughs> Again, we can probably figure out how this actually works. Because I showed you last time that in order to utilize glycogen, please, if you, if you, if you scribble that uh, as well, leave a little bit of space up. We have the enzyme glycogen force Forelays, which catalyzes the reaction of glycogen to G1P plus glycogen N minus 1, basically, without without one glucose molecule. That's the phosphorylation. That, that's the phosphorylase. It takes away, it hydrolyzes one of the one four glycosidic bonds and replaces it with a phosphate. That is what the gly glycogen phosphorylase does. But The enzyme usually is what is called in the B state. It means low activity. So it doesn't do a lot. It doesn't produce a lot of glucose from the glycogen, which we could transport into the bloodstream. However, we can convert glycogen phosphorylase, and I abbreviate it as GlyPL, we convert it into the A state, which is highly active. And we do so by, guess what? We phosphorylate it. We add a phosphate group. This would be the active form of the glycogen phosphorylase. And in theory, in theory, we could use pKa for that, but that's too simple. We don't do simple. We actually have another step in it. We use another enzyme, which is called PHK, which stands for phosphorylase kinase. But PHK is not terribly active. So usually it hangs around as low active. 
but we can activate it. Any idea how we can activate it? Hey, cool! We can phosphorylate it. So we now need an enzyme that can phosphorylate phosphor phosphorylase kinase and this is done by PKA. And we know that PKA is under the control of glucagon. Yoo-hoo! Finally, glucagon activates PKA, activates phosphorylase kinase, activates glycogen phosphorylase. What we have here is what is called a kinase cascade. And a kinase cascade has the effect of just simply, again, amplifying a signal. So very quickly, upon glycogen stimulus, you spread the word, everybody who can do something Give me glucose. And that is exactly what happens. Now, another thing, how we can activate glycogen phosphorylase, the inactive form, is when there is not much energy around. If it's not much energy around, very clearly, we need glucose, even in the cell. So, glycogen phosphorylase, the low active form, is activated by a measure of low energy in the cell. Now, here's a question for you. What compound would you use to indicate that the cell has low energy? What compound would you use to indicate that the cell has high energy? What's the compound for high energy? Loud? ATP, absolutely right. That's high energy. What's the compound for low energy? You are almost there. Loud? AMP. Absolutely right. You're totally right. So, AMP is a measure of low energy. We have low energy. Hey, we need glucose. Where do we get glucose from? Glycogen. So, AMP is an activator of glycogen phosphorylase. It's an effector again. Also, another thing is we, we can do that also in muscle cells. Muscle cells are running out of ATP, so we need to touch our glycogen stores. What is important for muscle activity? We need ATP, yes, but also what else do we need for muscle activity? Calcium. Calcium, excellent. Where, where, where No? It's in a special sort of bags, which are derived from the endoplasmic reticulum, which is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That has lots of calcium in it. 
Now, when the muscle works, calcium is released into the cytoplasm, and that indicates, oh wow, there's some activity which needs energy. And calcium, therefore, activates the low active phosphorylase kinase. And the way it does that is PHK is made up of three subunits. A little bit like an Easter bunny. And this subunit here is actually a small protein, which is called calmodulin. And you can imagine what calmodulin binds. Calcium. So calmodulin binds to calcium. Uh, calcium binds to calmodulin, activates the calmodulin. Calmodulin, then, as a subunit, activates the low active phosphorylase kinase. How clever is that? But <laughs> there is more to it. I know you want to go home, but just before the break, let's do that because I think this is really clever. Now we've got our glycogen phosphorylase active. It degrades the glycogen, but we need to shut it down again. So we have to remove the phosphate group that we attached. And this is done by, well, an already familiar key player. It's the phosphoprotein phosphatase 1. So when this enzyme is there, it will remove it, and it shuts down glycogen phosphorylase, the active form, and it transfers it back into the inactive form. How does that work? Well, this PP1 actually has an activator. And it really is only active with this activator. But our friend PKA can actually phosphorylate the activator. As a consequence, the activator dissociates from PP1, and PP1 is no longer active. So what you see is we get a double whammy. Glycogen phosphorylase goes in that direction with PKA, And at the same time, PKA blocks the reverse reaction. And of course, we know that PKA is activated by CAMP. So if we get insulin in, which will destroy CAMP, we'll actually totally reverse the whole thing. And we go back to inactive glycogen phosphorylase, but the insulin then will also activate our glycogen synthase. And you tell me that biochemistry is boring. 
I think this is just... If you think about it, it activates that, it activates that, and then it inactivates the inhibitor. It's, it's like real life, isn't it? The friend of my friend is my friend, right? The enemy of my enemy... Uh, wait a moment. The enemy of my enemy... Oh, that's my friend as well. If you inhibit something, that it comes to a stop. If you inhibit the inhibitor, uh, inhibit the inhibitor, well, then you activate it. It's like minus times minus gives you plus. If you inhibit the inhibitor, that inhibits an activator. Jesus. Let's think about it over the break. Five minute break, okay? Thank you. 
you get presents from your flatmates? I did get a present from my flatmates. Did you clean the kitchen? Did I get his dress no, off? no, no, I didn't. My flatmates I just gave came, I just showed up, presents. sir. I just showed up and they gave me a present. It was a hot water bottle in the shape of a pug. With a, with, with, like it was fluffy and stuff. So. I said I couldn't sleep very well. And they said this would help. It was, it was adorable. My dad was present though. He was very confused. How? How? Usually I only get complaints about flatmates and... No, my flatmates are very kind to me, sir. No, no one has to report the nice stuff. So no. Yeah, no, that, 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 you're absolutely right. The good things usually get ignored. I didn't ignore it, sir, because now I've got a hot water bottle. That's, uh, that's sort of the good story for the week, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mind you, I'm listening to a German radio program in the morning, and every morning at half past six, they have the good news for the day, and it's always really lovely. And uh, for example, what was it today? Uh, somebody has developed um, a protective mechanisms make a protective mechanism made out of uh, brass uh, for injured tortoises <laughs> so if a tortoise is injured uh, and uh, and the shell is sort of cracked uh, what you can do is with the with the hook of the bra apparently you hook them back uh, together and the you know if it is depending on the size of the tortoise and the bra, you can use it also as some padding. And I thought that's, uh, yeah, that usually doesn't make the, the, the way into the news, but I think it's great. Okay, shall we reconvene on our journey? And I hope I can make this part a little bit uh, shorter. Mind you, we have to do a little bit of maths, but it's not too, too challenging. Right, we have discussed what we need to do if we need sugar. And I think everybody agrees with me, we are all in desperate need of sugar at the moment. And because we need energy, and I told you, we get the energy through glycolysis. So we have our, usually we have our glucose 6 phosphate 
And then we have a number of steps. Some of these steps are almost irreversible. So we've got, for example, PFK1, which phosphorylates fructose 1, for, uh, which uses fructose 6-phosphate and adds another uh, phosphate group. So we get fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. We then split the glucose. We get two, three carbon elements. We have bisphosphoglycerate kinase. That is an almost irreversible step. We then have PEP. Phosphoenol pyruvate, which we then can convert into pyruvate, and we get ATP out of this here. We get ATP also here. Now, one of the interesting things is <coughs> that this molecule, glucose 6-phosphate, actually, if it so desires, or if the body needs, can also use a different pathway. What we have here is what is called a branched pathway. It could either go down the route of glycolysis or it can go down the route of another metabolic pathway, which is called the pentose phosphate pathway. or just simply PPP. How does that actually work? So here we have our glucose 6-phosphate. Let's see if I can still draw that. That's our glucose 6-phosphate. <coughs> and what we can actually do is we can oxidize the 1 position. And we get eventually a molecule that looks like this one. This is called a lacton, or glucolacton. And what we do is we generate a compound called, oops, not NADH, but in this case, NADPH. This is sort of the big cousin of NAD or NADH, but it's not NADH, it's NADPH. It has a phosphate group in it. And this thing is extremely useful for other reactions when we want to build up molecules. When we want to build up molecules, this is called an anabolic reaction. In contrast to breaking down compounds like glucose 6-phosphate, this would be a catabolic. Please don't call it diabolic. Uh, as somebody did in an exam, it's not that bad. So we've got anabolic and catabolic. 
building anabolic, uh, if you think about anabolic uh, drugs like testosterone, they build up muscle. So NADPH is, for example, used in the synthesis of fatty acids or nucleotides. This NADPH, or this, this lactone, can be converted into, how do I do that? Six phosphor gluconate and what you see here it is actually an acid it is a sugar acid one two three four five six I think yes I've, I've done them right this six phosphor gluconate can then undergo a reaction where we chop off this acid area here and we remove it as carbon dioxide. And what we get, well, six minus one gives you five, a five sugar which is called ribulose 5-phosphate. And this ribulose 5-phosphate can be transferred into ribose 5-phosphate. What do we need ribose for? Where do we find ribose? <coughs> yes, in principle, DNA. What does DNA stand for? Deoxy, aha. Uh -huh. So it we would need to de uh, take, take a oxy group away and um, something horrible. No, I'm, I'm not telling you that because it's too horrible. Um, what DNA actually stands for, but I'm not. Um, or, so DNA and also for RNA metabolism, we need ribose. So this is how we make ribose through this pathway. And actually, 30% of the G6P in the liver goes down that pathway. But what we can also do, and here we also get another molecule of NADPH, what we end up with is a sort of a pool of five carbon sugars. And through a number of reactions, which I'm not going to bore you, we can do something incredibly clever. Let's just simply write down the number of carbons that we have. So we take two of these five sugars, five C sugars, and we do a little bit of maths with it. Five plus five gives 10. 10 can also be split into 7 plus 3, right? Which can be also split into 6 plus 4.
six. We know six sugars. We know six carbon sugars. And in this particular case, this sugar would be fructose 6-phosphate. Hey, cool! Because what we could do with this fructose 6-phosphate, we could feed that back into our glycolysis. So actually, when the glucose 6-phosphate takes this pathway, we bring it back to the fructose 6-phosphate. What do we do with the 4? Well, actually, with the 4, we add another of the 5 sugars. 4 plus 5 can be split into 6 plus 3. Hey, guess what? The 6 that we get here is again fructose 6-phosphate. Hey, how cool is that? We have another fructose 6-phosphate rescued, which then can go back into glycolysis if we don't need it for ribose synthesis. And this guy here, this 3, actually is glyceraldehyde. 3-phosphate. And again, we bring that back it goes somewhere in here. We get that back into glycolysis. So by just simply doing a little bit of maths, what we gain from it is NADPH but we don't lose the sugars. We don't lose the possibility of going down the glycolysis pathway. Of course, we used five sugars, five, we used three five carbon sugars, and we used three glucose for that, so we lost three carbons in the form of carbon dioxide. But if you really need NADPH, or ribose, you would go down this pathway. That makes sense? So that is sort of an additional pathway, which actually every single cell can do. If they can do glycolysis, then they can also use this PPP, and it's in the same compartment. So which, how does a cell make a decision which way it should go? Should it go down glycolysis? or should it go down the PPP route? <coughs> the answer is simple. <coughs> Excuse me. The answer is simple. If the cell needs ATP, then it goes down that way. It goes down the glycolysis pathway. If the cell needs, for example, ribose or NADPH for anabolic reactions, then these two compounds, ribose or NADPH, are very low. They are removed, basically, from the pool. And therefore, it will pull the glucose 6-phosphate in this direction. So it is basically like economics. It is a question of supply and demand. And just simply by applying the laws of thermodynamics, and I know it's the T word and everybody hates it, but with that, we can dictate which way the compound flow. And actually, because we are talking about a flow here, the technical term for flowing actually is 
flux and different compounds can direct the flux in which way glucose 6 phosphate is moving make sense this is one of the big pathways which happens in the cytosol whoa now let's have a look again at our glycolysis because I know that you so love it again we said glycogen produces glucose <coughs> produces ATP produces also NADH ATP we have for five to six seconds glycogen we have for a day <coughs> we know how we can release glucose from glycogen but what actually happens when we go on a diet you know Lent is upon us <coughs> people do all sorts of weird and wonderful diets I'm not going I'm not going to eat chocolate alcohol asparagus things like that I don't eat full stop how long actually can let's say a 70 kilo person with moderate activity how long can they survive without any food intake what do you reckon a week two weeks two weeks yeah three weeks the number is right it's three months you can survive without food for about three months if you are heavily obese and there's a nice example calculation if you're 140 kilos theoretically you can survive for a whole year without food it's a bit of a drastic diet but it's possible so three months without food but well, well, wait a moment wait a moment there is something not right here okay because I told you glycogen stores will be empty about after 24 hours and we also need glucose for the brain and the red blood cells where do we get the glucose from sorry from fat stores in theory yes fat burning takes place kicks up in uh, after two to four days and we will discuss that next week how that actually works but what do we do in the meantime our glycogen stores are empty the brain is desperate for glucose what can we do actually what we can do is we can produce glucose and that is what happens in the liver in specialized cells in the kidney in some intestine cells and in some specialized cells in the brain we can make 
sugar. We can make glucose. One of the problems in making glucose is that we have three steps in, gluco uh, in glycolysis that we can't easily reverse. So we have um, fructose 6-phosphate into fructose... Oh. Fructose one six bisphosphate. We have the bisphosphoglycerol glycerate. And that goes to PEP. And we've got phosphoenol pyruvate with the help of uh, with the help of pyruvate kinase, which goes to pyruvate. These are the three steps that we can't reverse in glycolysis. So we can't just simply let glycolysis run in the reverse direction. It's not possible. We have to bypass these steps. But the principle is we take some pyruvate and go all the way back to glucose. Well, you might say, well, if we've got pyruvate, what's the point? Well, actually, if we had pyruvate, that wasn't, wouldn't be a big problem. We don't have pyruvate. But what we can use instead is we can use proteins from the muscle. And what we can do is we can remove the amino group from the amino acids. So for example, if you've got alanine, would be alanine. If we remove that and simply replace it with uh, oxygen, hey, look at that. We've got pyruvate. And we can convert quite a number of amino acids, and they are called glucogenic glucose-generating amino acids, we can convert lots of these amino acids into pyruvate. But we have a problem. And one of the big problems is here. We cannot reverse the rea reaction pyruvate to phosphoenol pyruvate. That does not work. So how can we overcome this blocking step? There's an incredibly clever mechanism. If we have pyruvate, the first thing that we do with it, we are in the cytosol at the moment. The first thing that we do, is we transport pyruvate into mitochondria.
there's a particular transporter in mitochondria that allows us the transport into mitochondria. Why? All will be re revealed in a minute. So this is our pyruvate. And in the mitochondria, we have an enzyme, which is called pyruvate carboxylase. And what pyruvate carboxylase does, it takes a CO2, carbon dioxide. It needs a special cofactor, which is called biotin, or vitamin H. And it needs GTP. And it attaches this carbon dioxide to this side of the pyruvate. What we get is a <coughs> this would be two acid groups joined together, that would be oxalic acid. And this compound is basically acetate. So this compound is oxalacetate. We will hear more about oxalacetate next week when we discuss the Krebs cycle. The great thing about oxalacetate is it cannot leave the mitochondria. It's trapped in there. It can't disappear. Now, why do we need to do that in the mitochondria? Because, as we discuss next week, there is another reaction of the pyruvate that we use where we do exactly the opposite. We cut off a carbon dioxide from pyruvate. And we can't have the two opposing reactions in the same compartment. Because, you know, one says, chop it off. Another one says, add it on. That would be madness. So that's why we have to transport the pyruvate into the mitochondria where we have the pyruvate carboxylase. So now we have oxalacetate in the mitochondria. And now, who cares? Well, actually, the problem is that all our enzymes for the reverse of the glycolysis are in the cytosol. So we have to get the oxalacetate out of the mitochondria. But I told you, the mitochondria don't let go of oxalacetate. But what we can do is we can use NADH. And we've got lots of NADH in the mitochondria because we generate ATP there. And we can convert that into this compound. We know what this is. This is malate. And 
what we can do with malate, I told you last week, there is a shuttle, actually, that transports NADH into the mitochondria with the, what is called the malate aspartate shuttle. But this time, we don't transport NADH. We shall simply transport malate out of the mitochondria. It's the malate aspartate shuttle. Now we have malate in the cytosol. And we can convert it back into oxal acetate. <laughs> Where it really shouldn't be, but, well, We've got it there. Now, in a second reaction, what did I say? Oh, I think I made a mistake, but it's, it's, sorry. This one here should be ATP, but this one here is GTP. With the help of GTP, We chuck off the carbon dioxide again. And what we get is PEP, phosphorinol pyruvate. So what you see is, in order to get PEP from pyruvate in the first place, in the case of the glycolysis, it was easy. We just use PEP and go down to pyruvate. And we got some ATP out of it. Doing the reverse is incredibly complicated. It's not straightforward. We have to activate it. We have to add carbon dioxide and ATP and GTP. And then we have to remove the carbon dioxide again in order to get it in the reverse reaction. Yeah. But we now have PEP. And we can make the whole thing run, glycolysis. At one point, we have to add another ATP in order to get the bisphosphate glycerate. So that's one of the irreversible steps, but again, with the help of ATP, we can get there. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention the enzyme here that is called PEP carboxykinase. It's a rather complicated enzyme.
And we then can, so let's see what is our, what, uh, what have we used? We have used one ATP here, one GTP, and another uh, ATP here. GTP and ATP, they can be interconverted uh, with each other, so we're not too worried. So we need three ATPs, actually, to get to this step here. And we need two of these bisphosphate glycerates to get back to a six-carbon body. So actually, the whole process consumes six ATP. It, it doesn't generate energy. It consumes energy. It's madness, isn't it, to have that? Well, actually, we need that because the brain and the red blood cells say, sorry, mate, I need glucose. Whatever other crap you give me to eat, I can't deal with. I need glucose. And in order to pander to their wishes, the body has to invest energy, actually, to feed the brain. That sucks, because glucose only produces two ATPs. So you have to basically subsidize them. But you know, for some, the brain is important. And therefore, we have to do that. So we create our, from the six carbon, in the reverse reaction of the glycolysis, we create fructose one six these phosphate. And true to glycolysis, we remove a phosphate here. The enzyme is called fructose 1,6-B-phosphatase. And actually, that is the slow step in the whole process. That's the rate-limiting step. We then con convert the F six phosphatase, we can convert that into glucose six phosphate. But that doesn't help us glucose six phosphate. Because what we need is we need to supply the brain and the red blood cells with that glucose. But if we've got glucose six phosphate, it is trapped in the cell, in our liver cell. So we wouldn't get it out. So we have to remove the phosphate. But if we did remove it, our hexokinase or glucokinase would immediately come and say, oh, hang on, there's a glucose running wild. We just add the phosphate again at the expense of another ATP. So what we need to do in this case is we transport the glucose 6 phosphate into, this time it's not the mitochondria, it, we transport it into the endoplasmic reticulum. Glucose 6 phosphate is in the endoplasmic reticulum, and we have the enzyme glucose 6 phosphatase. 
And this enzyme is only located in the endoplasmic reticulum of liver, kidney, certain intestine, and certain astrocyte types. Very, very specific. And that is why these cells can produce new glucose. And that process is, by, by the way, is called gluconeogenesis. In the endoplasmic reticulum, the phosphate group is removed, and we have glucose. And the glucose then can be secreted through the secretory pathway into the bloodstream. But to produce glucose through the pathway of gluconeogenesis, it is not suitable for energy production. It just simply doesn't add up. You have to invest more, then you get more out of it in form of ATP. And you really only have to, can do that when your glucose levels in the blood are dangerously low. Only then this pathway kicks in. And again, it needs to be fine-tuned. And there are quite a number of regulators of these enzymes involved. But I'm not going to bore you with that, because I can tell that at the moment your glucose levels are probably going close to negative range. I shall see you tomorrow for some more statistics. Thank you very much.